Hello everybody and welcome to my literary Corona kitchen. Today we are going to have a very special guest with us. Uh, Karen Slaughter is going to join us for a conversation in a bit. And before that, I'm going to give a short introduction uh, in Finnish about her latest novel out in Finland, The Last Widow, The Man in Leski in Finnish. And then we'll switch back to uh, English. So stay tuned. I'm going to speak Finnish for a moment and then we'll switch back to English when Karen Slaughter is, join, is joining us for a conversation. Hei parallaa kaikille. Tänään meillä on todella jännittävä koronakeittiö, nimittäin rikoskirjallisuuden supertähti Karen Slaughter uh, liittyy meidän seuraamme aivan tuo, tuossa tuokiossa. Sitä ennen kerron hieman Karen Slaughterin viimeisimmästä suomennuksesta, viimeisestä leskestä ja muutenkin hänen tuotannostaan, josta tykkään useista syistä. Tämä viimeinen leski on yhdeksäs osa Will Trent-sarjassa, mutta jos ei ole lukenut aikaisemmin Karen Slaughteria tai Will Trent-sarjaa, ei tarvitse huolehtua, sillä Karen Slaughterin thrilleristin lahjoista kertoo se, että hän kirjoittaa yksittäisiä osia sarjaan tavalla, joka mahdollistaa kuitenkin sen, että sarjaa voi lukea ihan missä tahansa järjestyksessä. Ja ei tarvitse siis huolehtia siitä, että eikö tajua jotain, tai pitäisikö tässä nyt jotenkin muistaa mitä, tai tietää, mitä on tapahtunut jossain muualla osassa. Ei tarvitse. Tietenkin lukukokemus voi olla erilainen, mutta en minäkään näitä kirjoja ole lukenut ilmestymisjärjestyksessä. Siis voi siis aivan hyvin äh, hypätä matkaan kesken sarjan, eikä tarvitse huolehtia siitä, että ei tajua jotain. Sitten tietenkin voi myös lukea standalone-kirjoja ja näitäkin on ilmestynyt useimpia. Menneisyyden jäljet on oikein jännittävä tarina äidistä ja tyttärestä. Spoilereita en anna, eikä spoilereita anneta myöskään kohta Karen Slaughterin kanssa käytävässä keskustelussa. Tästä menneisyyden jäljestä on muuten tulossa Netflixille TV-sarja Tony Collett, jota me kaikki rakastamme oh, näyttelee siinä. Ja tämä on Jännittävä. Uskon, että tv sarjakin on sitten jännittävä. Erinomainen valinta muuten kesätrilleriksi, jos sellaista vielä tässä kaipaa. Mutta palataan tähän nyt vielä tähän viimeiseen leskeen, sillä kyseessä on todella ajankohtainen teos. Siinä on nimittäin epidemia ja siinä on myös rasismia, joten erittäin ikävällä tavalla ajankohtainen, mutta erittäin mukaansa tempaava teos. Epidemiaan, en, en anna siis painereita, mutta sen verran kerrotaan, että epidemia tässä, epidemia tässä on. Ja ää, sitten tässä on ää, white power-tyyppisiä henkilöitä, ää, jotka eivät halua tehdä maailmalle kovinkaan hyviä asioita, sanotaan nyt tällä tavalla. Ja maailmaa pelastamassa on Will Trent ja Sarah Linton. Kaksikko. Sarah Linton tuli äh, Karen Slaughterin kirjoihin mukaan jo esikoisromaanissa. Sen nimi oli Sokaistuneet ja se ilmestyi vuonna 2001 Blindsided äh, englanniksi. Ja, äh, nämä Sarah Linton kirjat kuuluvat äh, Grand Countyn sarjaan, joka sijoittuu fiktiiseen Grand Countyin, mutta voimme ajatella sitä Georgiana. Karen Slaughterin kirjat sijoittuvat äh, Georgiaan ja Atlantaan. Sarah Linton on äh, lastenlääkäri ja äh, huolisyntutkija ja Will Trent sitten taas puolestaan Georgian Investigative Bureau'n erikoisagentti, joka on myös dyslektikko. Ja tämä on todella kiinnostavaa. Äh, siis, tietenkin, siis en, en oikein ole ihan varma, että onko edes toista tällaista sankaria, jolla äh, olisi äh, dysleksia. Ja se, millä, millä tavalla Karen Slaughter kirjoittaa tästä henkilöstä, on myös Silvia avaavaa meille muille siis siinä, että miten hän näkee maailman dyslektikon silmin. Ja siinä mielessä tämä kirja edustaa niitä asioita, joita kirjallisuus parhaimmillaan edustaa, eli avaa ainakin minulle uusia maailmoita. Ja samalla tavalla sitten Sarah Linton, joka on lääkäri, niin se, miten hänen silmiensä kautta, eli lääkärin silmien kautta nähdään maailma, niin se on hyvin taitavasti ja uskottavasti tehty, ja se on myös yksi syy, miksi 
tykkään Slaughterin kirjoista, se, että juoni ja henkilöt ovat erinomaisessa balanssissa keskenään. Aika useinhan thrillereissä juoni jyrää henkilöt, ja, tai sitten Trilleri ei enää ole trilleri, kun keskitytään liian paljon kaikkeen, kaikkeen muuhun kuin itse asiassa siihen juonen etenemiseen. Se myöskin, Karen Slaughterin alut ovat aina hyvin dynaamisia, mennään suoraan asiaan ja sitä kautta siis nämä tempaavat tarinat ihan mukaansa. Mutta yleensä koronakeittiössä olen aina tehnyt jotain ruokia, ja, jotka sopii jotenkin teemaan tai kirjoihin, mutta tällä kertaa on mukana vain vihreä omena, sillä tässä kirjassa ei hirveästi ehditä syömään. Yksi omena ehditään kyllä syömään pikkuisen aupalaa, mutta... Mutta muuten henkilöt eivät oikeasti ehdi ajattelemaan mitään tällaisia, että mitä tänään syötäisiin päivälliseksi, koska heillä on todellakin piset tilanteet edessä ja pelkäävät oman elämänsä ja rakkaittensa puolesta. Karen Slaughterin naishenkilöt ovat sellaisia, että he ovat oikeastaan suoraan Killing Eve TV-sarjasta pikemminkin kuin jostain Jostain sellaisesta sarjasta tai äh, elokuvasta, jossa äh, nainen odottaa miehen pelastavan. Äh, Slotterin kirjoissa naiset pelastavat itse itsensä ja äh, myöskin kostavat itse ja ylipäänsä ottavat elämänsä haltuun. Ja heidän ongelmiinsa on aika helppo kyllä äh, samaistua. He ovat, ne ovat oikean elämän ongelmia, siis, joita he kohtaavat. Ja se varmaan onkin myös yksi Soterin äh, suosion syy, että lukijoiden on helppo samaistua äh, thrillerin henkilöihin, mikä ei itse asiassa ole ihan itsestään selvää sekään. Mutta kohta äh, jatkamme näistä kysymyksistä muun muassa. Itse kirjailijan kanssa Karen Slaughter liittyy seuraamme tuossa tuokiossa. Ja lukekaa ihmeessä näitä kirjoja. And now I'm gonna switch back into uh, English. I just told the Finnish audience uh, something about Karen Slaughter's work, uh, about The series Grand County, uh, the first novel came out in 2001, presenting uh, the character, uh, which is going to be in this novel as well, uh, Sarah Linton, a pedestrian and a coroner. And uh, later on, she published her first Will Trent book. This is the ninth Will Trent book. Uh, and the first one, uh, first one came out in 2001. 2006 in English, and later on, these two characters, Sarah Linton and Will Trent, joined their forces to save the world, and they are together in this in this book, which uh, has well, it's it's um, it's I don't want to give you spoilers, and I will I, I won't, and I'm not gonna give you spoilers. Uh, in the interview either, um, but um, the book is about white power moment, racism and epidemias. So it's definitely the book of the day. And um, so I think, I think she is joining us. Yes, she is. So uh, please welcome Karen Slaughter to my Corona kitchen with me. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yes. Yes. Hello. Hello, hello. Um, <laughs> technology uh, is not my strong, uh, I'm, I'm not strong with technology, so I'm always somehow <laughs> super, super happy when something like this actually, you know, uh, we made it. We made yes. it. We're here. Yeah. We are here. Um, Thank you for joining me for my literary kitchen. Um, I just gave a short introduction about your books to Finnish readers. And uh, your books, well, to start with, um, thank you for the wonderful writing. You gave me a lot of, <laughs> you gave me many sleepless nights, which is a good thing. Um, 
because the books are, books book is so exciting um did i want, wanted, wanted to ask you because your books are set in atlanta so how are things at the moment in atlanta because uh, perhaps yeah <laughs> uh, because perhaps our, all our followers are not aware that in atlanta uh, uh, Ray, uh, Richard Brooks, a 27-year-old uh, colored man, was just killed by two white cops, and there have been demonstrations. So, uh, how are things uh, in Atlanta? Well, you know, first I should say I live in a part of Atlanta that isn't seeing any of the protests at yeah. the level that they are downtown. I live far from downtown. But we did have a protest in our, our neighborhood uh, where everybody got together. And one of my neighbors actually was spat upon by mm -hmm. a, a white man who was probably in his 60s and was very angry and yelling at everybody and trying to push people and telling them to go home. And uh, he pushed my neighbor really hard and he, he spit on him and he said, I have COVID, so I hope you die. Uh, oh. Yeah, fortunately, my neighbor recorded it on his phone, so he was able to file a complaint. But, you know, it's it's very tense right now. Um, I have uh, I've been in Atlanta for a really long time. I've lived in Georgia for a while. I think that we'll get back to a sense of ease eventually. But I think also that changes need to be made. Uh, and what happened with that uh, use of force was totally uncalled for. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, the police are authorized to use uh, force if their life is in danger. Mm -hmm. And being tasered, you know, is not your life being in danger. It's just you being really pissed off that someone okay. got the better of you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that we, we're going to see a, a change in what's allowed with policing. And, you know, the big, big thing I think that has to change is there has to be accountability. Mm -hmm. I talk to a lot of police officers, and I don't know one police officer who thinks, for instance, the man who killed George Floyd had any justification to do that. You know, so I think if we have real consequences when police officers do these horrible things, that it will make it easier for the good cops to be good cops and return to community um, servicing rather than these this militants that it, yes. that some police officers have specifically against the black community yeah well I, actually you answered already to my question because I, I would have asked that what should be done for the world to be a better place um how, how do you make research because you already you, you know you said that you know cops and and you have well you know you have a special agent uh, in world trend series and then what I admire in your writing is that actually the reader can see the world through the eyes of Sarah Linton, a doctor, and then also Will Trent. And, and not only, not a, so I know you are not a doctor, I guess. No. <laughs> but uh, when, when you're reading, I was thinking, that, okay, she must be, I mean, uh, she has a hidden past as a doctor because you know so well and actually um, as, as an author, I always find it kind of um, consuming to think that if I have a new character, then I have to have a profession. I kind of also have to learn the profession to see the world through that profession. But you do it so well. So how do you do research? Well, I mean, I'm sure you know this as an author yourself. You've got, you can find people in policing and in medicine and in other fields where you need information, but it's very rare to find someone who understands that you're telling a story. Yeah. You know, so I have a doctor, he lives in Texas actually, and he was an ER doctor and he was a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of his favorite students because I, I would be the student who killed everybody but because I'm just writing about it, uh, you know, he understands when I say, oh, I want Sarah to do this, this, and this. He doesn't say, well, that would never happen. Or, you know, that's not possible. Or he says, okay, well, let's figure out how to make it medically accurate. And that's a, that's a real gift to be able to understand 
you know, and, and there, there are uh, writers who are doctors like Tess Gerritsen, um, yeah. Robin Cook, you know, and they, they have the medical background, but I think it, it helps me not to have the medical background because mm -hmm. I don't feel like I have to put all the steps on the page and I can just make it, I can come up with stuff that would be crazy. I mean, let's be honest, there was no doctor who's seen all the horrible things Sarah yeah. has seen. Um, but, you know, he understands. And the police officers I work with um, and who give me ideas for cases or they point me in the right direction, they, they have an understanding that this is storytelling. Um, yeah. And so they, by, after all this time, they know what I'm looking for. And I, okay. I'm lucky. Yeah, yeah you, are, you are lucky because sometimes you have to find a help that understands what an author, kind of, uh, they have to have an author's Eye, at least kind mm -hmm. of small eye uh, that meets your needs um, and um, did you always want to write crime fiction because you've written like always <laughs> I guess <laughs> but did you did you ever write poetry or, or, or I don't know, historical fiction or something else or did you know that you want to write crime fiction well, I did start with historical fiction because I love it as a reader, ah, um, but it had a murder in it. <laughs> oh. um, and I think, I mean, I'm very happy to be a crime writer because we sell the most books. Oh. Uh, but, you know, I write within the crime genre and many other genres. So I'm writing love stories or I'm writing, yeah. uh, you know, because I'm a woman, domestic stories or um you know i just feel like i i have the freedom within the thriller genre to do whatever i want i've written historical uh fiction within the thriller genre mm -hmm. with a few of my novels so you know i just i think i'm really glad to be called a thriller writer because that's what everybody wants but i think thrillers <laughs> aren't really confined to just the thriller part yeah. oh yeah 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 definitely i i think you are um... Uh, exploring or, or, or being or through the genre gives you the endless possibility actually to expose the problems of the society or the community and um, and, and also crimes reflection of the time and the world and the society and the com community um, but I what I, what I do um, I want uh, would what I was thinking while I was reading your books that uh, how is that you found such a delicate balance between the plot and the character? Because you really care about your characters and, and you force also the readers to care about the characters. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's pretty rare, actually. Thrillers are so plot-driven and action-driven, uh, but you don't, you don't actually, uh, you don't pay attention to unnecessary details. So how did you find this balance, which is a very good balance? Well, thank you. But you, I mean, you know this, it's, a, it's probably the most important secret to any book is yeah. if, if you have a great plot, but your characters are not believable, then no one will care about the plot. Or if you have great characters and you don't have a great plot, you know, it just doesn't work. So you do have to find a good balance. And, you know, a lot of people ask me about the fact that I write very unflinchingly about violence. And I think the reason it resonates is because you always have an emotional reaction through one of the characters. Um, you're never going to read about a crime and there's no context placed yeah. around it. Because I'm not interested in that. You know, I think it what makes what makes people really interested in reading a crime novel is not that, you know, so much, okay, well, this horrible crime happened, but why did it happen? What does it do to people? What does it leave behind? Yeah. And so by putting it in context, I think it gives it a good balance because you don't want unrelenting yeah. darkness. You know, you yeah. know, and you know what unrelenting darkness yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. The highest suicide rate. So yeah. I don't want to, you know, have a really dark book without, you know, some some laughter and then some love and the sense that, you know, Will and Faith really support each other and yeah. Will and Sarah have a strong relationship and they all work together in service of the plot. Yeah, uh, actually, in my Corona kitchen, I usually prepare a dish that is somehow 
uh, matching with the story or the themes. But this time, because they are not really eating much, they, they don't have time to eat, except Sarah is eating one apple in a very, <laughs> in a very good spot. I'm not going to tell our, our followers why she is eating the apple and where she is, but she's only uh, uh, eating the apple. And then later on, they do have some breakfast, but otherwise they are too busy to uh, prepare anything or eat anything or actually not even to think about food at all. So this is the only, this is the only thing they have. And that is, that is actually one example of a uh, good example uh, of, of not having unnecessary details because that's something that actually bothers me in quite many uh, crime, uh, well, books or, or uh, TV shows that people certainly start to eat even though their life is at stake. And who, yeah. <laughs> who's able to think about some gourmet uh, dinner when you are about to die? So um, that's, uh, that's one example of not having something that is not necessary. Um, uh, what, what I um, also wanted to ask you is that, um, oh yes, the um, Will Trent has uh, dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, uh, I, um, I don't, well, I don't know. The, uh, he might be the only hero with dyslexia in crime fiction. I don't know, I'm not sure, but I, I haven't met another one. So. Uh, could you, uh, which I think is wonderful and also wonderful because uh, reading about him actually helps you to the readers to understand dyslexia. Uh, well, yeah, please. So, you know, my sister has dyslexia. Yeah. And we grew up in a time when if a, a kid was struggling in school, the response was that kid's just stupid. Yeah. And so she was a very smart young girl but she just wasn't very fluent with reading and language mm -hmm. and so it was very difficult for her to be told that she was lazy and stupid yeah. when in fact she just had this language processing disorder and she didn't realize that until she was in her 20s and someone told her and suddenly it made yeah. sense um, but she was always being I mean she ended up dropping out of school mm -hmm. uh, because of it and I wanted to talk about that uh, experience, and it, it kind of became such an important part of the Will Trent character, yeah. because he has a secret that he's hiding, um, and, and that, you know, it's sad that he hides it, but police officers are very clannish, mm -hmm. and they don't, like, they don't like cops who have unusual issues. Uh, so, you know, beating their wives and things like that is perfectly yeah. acceptable, but dyslexia, you know, <laughs> is something that they don't understand. And so he has, he feels he has to hide it and it's a great source of shame. And I liked the idea of him not being perfect because a yes. lot of times, you know, and, and you might, you must face this as a writer where you have a character you really love and you want to make them perfect. You don't want bad things to happen yeah. to them. Um, and I wanted him to have this issue and to not have had a family because yeah. I wrote about Sarah for so long and her family is such an important part of her life. And then to have Will who has no family except yeah. the family he makes on his own, you know, with Amanda and then eventually Faith, that was an interesting thing to write about. And as you know, when you're an author, you want to write about something that interests you. And I thought it would be a, a good way to learn more about dyslexia and, yeah. and have a deeper understanding of just how it affects people. Definitely. I, I, think, um, I think this is very helpful for many people who might actually know someone who has a dyslexia. Because it's not, I know also someone who has hit on the dyslexia for a very mm -hmm. long time. And, uh, and managed even to hide it from the family and probably because um, before, well, people just didn't talk about it. So I think this, yeah, the, um, the, well, this is again one example of how literature actually can make the world a better place because it can help you to understand other people. Um, you are a spokeswoman for, um, for libraries mm -hmm. uh, and Save Libraries initiative and I actually watched your great speech on the National Book Festival where you so beautifully talked about the importance of, of the libraries. So could you, could you 
share your thoughts about that. Why libraries are investment for the future? Well, you know, I can only speak to the American experience yeah. because I know, especially in Scandinavia, you value education in a way that we don't here. Uh, and you encourage reading and literacy in a way that we don't necessarily have yeah. here also. You know, we have a president who's probably never read a book. <laughs> yeah. Um, so even the ones he claims to have written. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's a really strange phenomenon here because you would think in times like right now where we're having such difficulty with uh, money and funding government on the yeah. local level, that they would say the one thing we can't cut is libraries because that gives access to reading. And reading is not just for entertainment, yeah. you know, it, especially for children. Children who read are going to do better in school. If they do better in school, they're going to go to college. If they go to college, they're going to get better jobs and they're going to pay more taxes. So it's really like a very lucrative pipeline to have reading available, readily available. Uh, and so that's something that I've noticed just living in the United States that hasn't been a priority for a really long time. Yeah. And I started this charity and I got a bunch of author friends to agree to help. And mm -hmm. we raise money to help libraries, whether they're doing a reading circle or if they need a toilet fixed or, yeah. you know, whatever they need, we give them the money if we can. Uh, and to date we've given away almost half a million dollars. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, unfortunately, yes, even though Finland is very proud for library network, but unfortunately, even though we pay the taxes, then all politicians don't actually think that libraries are that important. So I'm afraid even though we, we, we don't, we are not raising money for libraries in, in Finland, but, uh, but, but, um, we need to talk about the importance of libraries because all politicians don't think that libraries are important, something else yeah. is more important. But you said it so well. Um, why reading our libraries, uh, free access to libraries is, is, is important. It's also important for equality because everybody can have the access or if everybody can have the access to. And to you know, it's not a, in the United States, it really isn't a political thing because yeah. I, a lot of Republicans, like here in Georgia, our Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. loves to read. Yeah. And he, he's in charge of our government, basically. Uh, our, he's supposed to be, you know, leading our government. Yeah. And he's a big advocate for library funding. I mean, he's actually, you know, the library might say, can you please give us this much money? And he'll give even more. Yeah. Because he has a, an understanding of, of how important it is to communities. And he's from a rural area. Uh, so he gets that, for instance, a lot of children who live in more rural areas of the United States don't have access to the Internet. Yeah. Uh, which we're finding out how important that is with all these yeah. virtual uh, classrooms. But, you know, it, I, I've spoken in, in many states to various governments and Republicans, independents, Democrats. They they all, you know, for the most part, except for the stupid ones agree yeah. that we need libraries and reading and they understand how important it is. So, you know, that's why I always say funding a library isn't a political thing unless your political party is that you're stupid uh, yeah. and then you don't want to fund it. So yeah. it, it really is a kind of a universal thing. Yeah. I, I, I agree totally. Um, I think we have um, also, or at least I think later on we might have some uh, aspiring authors, and I'm not going to ask how to, what to do to become an author, <laughs> uh, but instead I'm going to ask you, um, um, what are the things, um, the, or what are the worst mistakes of, uh, you can do when you write a thriller? Well, I think the biggest thing is you need to play fair with your reader. And you need to, yeah. when they get to the end, when they see who committed the crime or who the bad person is, they need to say, oh, that makes sense, not what the hell just happened. And for me, it's important before I start a novel to know how it's going to end. I have to know who ah. the person is. 
Um, and so, you know, some authors are different. They figure it out along yeah. the way. But if you do only figure it out on the last page, then you should go back through the previous pages and weave in that person. Because if it's just out of the blue, that, that's not why people, most people read crime novels. You know, they want it to make sense. And I think that's why crime is so popular. You know, we live in the world where not a lot of stuff makes sense. Yeah. And where we might feel like our institutions are not functioning the way we would like them to function. And, you know, especially if you're a woman, you know, your health care, your reproductive rights, you know, your right not to be assaulted or sexually mm -hmm. harassed are all uh, being challenged. And so, you know, if you read a book where a really bad person does bad things to women and in the end he's punished horrifically, that's a great ending to a, a book that you don't <laughs> normally get in real life. So, you know, there has to be some, there has to be a feeling of satisfaction, I think, uh -huh. for the ending. And most authors, for, the biggest mistake is they spend a lot of time on the beginning of the book. You know, that, yeah. you can, you can almost see how many times they've reread that first chapter or first scene and worked and worked and worked on it. You should do just as much work at the end. And that's the difference between uh, uh, someone who wants to be a writer and someone who's an author is they put oh. the work in. Um, so that I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. The other big mistake is thinking that you're going to be successful because it's a very competitive field, just publishing in general, yeah. especially with COVID because now everybody's at home and they think I should write that novel. I've always uh -huh. wanted to write. Um, but, you know, it's a very difficult job and, and no one would choose to be a writer because it's hard and it's very frustrating and it's, it can be physically and emotionally very draining. Um, and if, you, if you're chosen like by the, the universe to be a writer, you have to put the work in and, you know, you're n probably not going to be successful and, you know, maybe your friends will buy copies and you're, or, you know, there's the old joke that your family will buy a copy of your book, but not read it. And your friends will read it, but they won't buy a copy. Um, so, you know, just be prepared for that and establish what you think of as success. Is success, I wrote a book. Is it a book gets published or is it I'm number one in Finland? You know, you have to decide for yourself yeah. what's important to you. Definitely. Um what I, um, well, speaking of, of the success, uh, you, you already your first novel was a successful one. Um, but how do you manage to keep up the quality of your writing, um, which I think is unusual for, for, for an author who publishes so often? So you must have a new one already in the pipe. I mean, I think the next one is coming in August. Uh, has the COVID affected the publishing schedule? schedule? Um, well, yes. Yeah. So it, it's just published in the Netherlands and Flanders. It will yeah. publish in the UK next week oh. and then in August in the US. So, you know, it, it just it rolls out slowly. Yeah. Um, okay. But that, that's the one that I wrote last year. So the oh. one I'm working on now is going to be out next year. Um, but I think Finland, because of the translation, is one book behind in yeah. general, um, which is actually really nice for me because, um, you know, I talk a lot about the new book. And then when I do Finnish interviews, I can talk about a different book. So it gives me a little break. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I love writing. I just absolutely love it. And I'm still passionate about it. I love telling stories. Um, the, the big thing I'm having to talk about or think about now, and, and maybe you are too, is to how do I incorporate the virus into my next book? You know, because I write very realistic of the moment stories and I'm trying to project what life will be like next year when this book comes out yeah. in June, July and August, you know, will we have testing at home? Will we have morons who won't mm -hmm. test at home and they'll say they're fine? You know, will we have, we have such a large anti-vaccine community? Um, and will they refuse a vaccine if there's a vaccine? You know, how, how is the world going to look in a year when we kind of figure this out uh, and, it, and we go back to our lives, you know? Um, so that's something I'm having to think about with this next book, in addition to 
murder and s crime solving and all that kind of stuff. So it's a lot to juggle, but it, it's fascinating. Yeah. In a way, I'm kind of uh, becoming a futurist because I'm having to, um, you know, figure out what life, you know, transposing nor what is normal life pre-COVID to yeah. what post-COVID will be. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yes, we'll and you right. already had in the last uh, last video. Uh, uh, you already had measles. Yes. So uh, epidemia is no news to you, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was yeah. a lot, it was very interesting to research that, you know, because a lot of people um, talk about measles as if it's benign, but it's yeah. very dangerous. And yeah. I, 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 um, I worry about people who, who, I mean, it's a very Western privilege not to be vaccinated yeah. because, you know, we have hospitals, we, you know, we have this infrastructure and then people still die. But, you know, it, it reduces the odds of you dying because we have all this Western medicine. But then people in third world countries have nothing and it spreads there like wildfire and people die, you know, and, and it's, it's a really horrible thing. So I thought I would talk about that and talk a little bit about the white supremacist movement, mm -hmm. which is very scary uh, and is not just an American problem. You know, we no. see internationally how... Um, this disgusting ideology is spreading. It's as if we've all forgotten what wor World War II was yeah. about. Yes, yes, agreed. And, and these are also problems uh, we have in Finland as well. Uh, it is so weird to actually see that anti-vaccination movement exists in Finland. But I, now I hope that with the COVID people have also those anti-vaccine people would kind of realize what it means if you don't, if you have uh, have a disease with no vaccination. So I, I hope that this will change something for better. We'll yeah, see. I hope so. <laughs> we'll see. But we are, we are, soon we are about to wrap this up. Um, uh, yes, one, one, one more thing I wanted to ask about Will Trent is that how did you decide his name? Well, you know, I, I really gave a lot of thought to that. And I wanted him to have, a, you know, he doesn't have a middle name. And yeah. we find out where his name comes from in Criminal, which is a story that talks about Amanda when she was a young police officer yeah. and her history with him, which Will had no idea of. But I liked that it was basically two short, sharp names, you know, yeah. because it, it, it just phonetically, it made sense. But, you know, honestly, I was really aware by then of my international audience and I wanted to make it uh, something that was easily understood yeah. in other countries. You know, I always laugh, um, Yo Nesbo's character, Harry Hole. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what you would call someone's asshole. Yeah. So, you know, I thought I don't want to make a Harry Hole mistake. I want <laughs> I want Will Trent to be a universal thing. So that yeah. that's one of the reasons why I chose it. But you know, maybe you experience this. Sometimes um, characters' names just come to you and they stick, and that's who they are. Yeah. And so sometimes it's also very dis uh, very difficult to decide, even though readers might think that oh, this is a very simple name, but it might actually need like. <laughs> yeah, you might think author might think about uh, the very simple name for years. So um, yeah, Will Will is, is a very good, very good name actually. Um, and <laughs> and uh, what, well, one more thing I wanted to ask you about uh, the differences. Uh, I mean, you, you've traveled a lot for your translations. So do people actually read your books in a different way in different countries? Gosh, you know, I've never thought about that. I mean, at a very simple level, as an American, I have an advantage because everywhere else assumes that we're very violent and that police run down the streets and people run down mm -hmm. the streets with guns all the time. Um, but, you know, there are, are certain stereotypes, like people might, Americans might think Finnish people never smile and they just sit around drinking in the dark all the time, which some of them do. Um, but, uh, you know, 
I, I found Finnish people to be hilarious. They have a very dark sense of humor that I like, yeah. and I love going there. Uh, I love doing the sauna uh, and uh, going jumping into the, the ocean when it's freezing cold. I've done that several mm -hmm. times. Oh, you've done that? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I, the, one of my first trips there, I met a lovely woman from the Finnish American Society. She mm -hmm. had just been in Minnesota, where more people say they're Finnish in Minnesota than in actually do in Finland. Yeah. Um, and she took me to her sauna, and it's, it's lovely. It's right there uh, uh, on the water, and there's the smoke sauna and the different type levels of sauna. Uh, and I, I got right, scrubbed down by the washerwoman, and I had a massage. I ate some sausages on the fire. I ran down and jumped naked into the water, at, which was Whoa. shocking. It was just sh I was like, ah! <laughs> But oh, I've done wow, it several wow. times. I love it. It's one of my favorite things. And actually, I have a big birthday coming up. And if we're allowed to travel in January, that's where I want to go. I've never seen Lapland. I'd like to see that. Um, I remember the first time uh, I was on a Finnish mm -hmm. television morning show. And they were doing the weather. And they didn't do the weather for the top part of Finland. And I said, why don't you do that? And they said, it's so cold that the television signal doesn't reach. So... <laughs> Um, but I, you know, I, it, Finland is actually just one of my favorite countries in the world to visit. So I, whether or not they read it differently, I don't know. I mean, probably the, and you know, I know in Finland, if you're murdered, it's most likely a family member who's done it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I feel pretty safe in Finland since yeah. I don't have any family there. Uh, that mostly it's with the, the knife, that special knife that Finnish people generally have in their house. Yeah. And um, guns. So and guns. We have a lot stay of guns. away from that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, maybe maybe they perceive it differently. Or maybe when I talk about a small town, they're thinking of a town with 500 people when a small town in America is 30,000 people or fewer. Uh, yeah. But I, I think, it, you know, I have a very good translator there. So I think that they work carefully to try to give you the feeling. But of course, if you're Finnish, you're going to read it differently than if you're an American. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. Um, yeah, but, but, and I I trust that you don't get... From Finland, you probably don't get the questions you might get from some countries. Like, I, I don't think no one is going to ask you in Finland, are you married or... or um, no, never. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Never, in, in, oh, they barely ask me any questions. They just oh. sit there very quietly. Yeah. And then the, then afterwards, one person might say, that was very interesting. Thank you. And then I'll see they go online and they talk about how great it was and they had such a wonderful time. And I think, why didn't you say that there? <laughs> okay. Oh, well, that's but yet, you know, countries, yeah. countries are very different. Like in Brazil, they always hug you and they want to be yeah. close to you and talk to you and... In the Netherlands, they want to tell you that the book was too expensive because <laughs> Dutch people are very cheap. Or, you know, it just, it's it, different cultures have a different way of yeah. responding. But it, it's always interesting, though. I mean, I just find it really fascinating. Well, I, I'm, I have, I'm very happy to hear that you have enjoyed your travels to Finland because then we are hoping, of course, to see you here when the traveling is possible. Yes, and, and and I hope also that that you you'll have then when you come to Finland next time you have the chance to uh, see Lapland, yeah, uh, and uh, maybe meet a reindeer. So I love it. I did they meet have the reindeer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, reindeers, reindeer, reindeers. There are plenty of reindeers in in Lapland, but I cannot promise that you would see Aurora uh, borealis because. Even though I live in Finland, I've only seen it once. Really? So the, yeah. Okay. So well, don't, I'll go don't, to the reindeer then. <laughs> so don't trust if if the, all the advertisements saying that yes, Finland is all about polar bears and and uh, uh, that's what people think that we have polar bears. But you you've been here, so you know that yes. you don't meet polar bears in in Helsinki. Uh, but yeah, aurora borealis is is, uh, is something that we don't see every day, not even in Finland. But I hope that you'll have the chance to see them. So, well, thank you. Um, thank
thank you for this opportunity and thank you for joining me and, and telling telling us about your wonderful novel and i'm so much looking forward to the next one so um so i, I hope that um many other readers will also if they are not addicted to your novels then they soon will be thank you so, so much thank you uh and stay safe and and uh welcome to finland next time thank you bye 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 now we had um we ended our conversation with uh, Karen uh slaughter and um i'm very much already waiting for her next translation in finnish but if you haven't read her books then think about the last widow uh with very very um important topics uh and it's also exciting and then for example this pieces of her which is going to be adapted on netflix and uh and then I, now i just have to hope that i forget forget everything before the series comes <laughs> comes out um but uh thank you for joining us and um stay safe and see you later in my corona kitchen bye